Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, we just bless your holy name in this place. We just lift up the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you're already speaking to us. I thank you that your presence is already here, that you've already opened up the heavens tonight. And, uh, Father, we come hungry to hear your voice. Lord, we come with fresh fire, fresh desire. Lord, fill us according, according to the desire of our heart tonight. And I bless each one, Lord, with hunger for Jesus, the Word. So we ask that you would come as the living Word tonight, and that you would be living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, and that you would divide between soul and spirit tonight, and that you would come and bring freedom, truth, and most of all, bring the person of Jesus as we open up the scriptures and we search out the mysteries tonight of God, your ways, your wisdom, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. 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 Week two, we're coming to in the wisdom and ways of God. Now, homework reading for this week is Proverbs 5 to 9. We're working through the book of Proverbs. Anybody did their homework last week? Good. We did it on audio on the way here, <laughs> in the car, so we could say, we did the homework. <laughs> awesome. Faith comes by hearing, hearing through the Word of God, right? So it was very biblical. So whatever way you can get the Word of God into you, you know, whether you put it on while you're driving to work or driving kids to school or, um, or you, you get time to actually sit down and read, um, please get into the book of Proverbs. It will bless you. And it's one of those books that we need to keep going back to. Amen. And so this term is all about wisdom for living, wisdom for relationships, finances, and the ways of God. And I'm so excited about talking about the ways of God because I don't believe it's talked about enough. And I want to tell you that there is a culture that has developed in the prophetic, the so-called prophetic apostolic. And you hear me talk about it a lot. And this culture has become one that is so uh, fixed on what is sensational. The signs, the wonders, and the miracles. And that's all part of supernatural. That's all part of the presence of God. That's all part of the Word of God. But I want to talk to you tonight about discerning between soul and spirit. Discerning between what is God and what is not. And I find what tends to happen in this culture, if they're not fed the good stuff, the whole word, they start feeding on the junk stuff. And you talk to them about the ways of God, knowing Jesus, going after the person of Jesus. You talk to them about praying and seeking God, come to prayer, and they're not to be found. But they'll go to a conference where they get a prophecy and a tingle, and they see a sign, wonder, and miracle. And they go back to their old lives. And they go from mountaintop to mountaintop. And they never, they have a form of godliness but lacking the power. That's why we're looking at God's ways. Because I want you to know him. God's ways are the secret to you coming into the promises. And the mark of a true prophetic ministry or apostolic <coughs> ministry, I believe, is not just the release of the prophetic word, but they will become a mother and a father to you in the spirit, and they will train up the bride. They will train you in the ways of God so that you make it to the promised land. You know, I was thinking about, you come into the promises, I was thinking about this group. You know, there's about 20 million people in Australia. And on average, we get about 17 to 20 that enroll for the school. That makes you one in a million, right? You know, Caleb and Joshua were one in a million. Moses was one in a million. I want you to see yourself as chosen. And with that comes a price. I'm going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about the ways of God. 
And if you give yourself diligently to studying his ways, you embrace his ways, you seek his ways, which is who he is, I can tell you will become that one in a million that God can use. I'm going to show you that clearly in Scripture. Are you excited? This is Jesus. And I believe, you know, we get a lot of comments saying, I've never heard that before. Or, I can't believe that I haven't heard that before. Or, or my spirit's come alive listening to this. We were talking, Gabriana and I were talking, she said, why aren't people, you know, she had been listening to our things online. She said, I went through your whole school of prophets online. You know, why, why aren't there more people, you know, getting this into them? I want to tell you that the ways of God and the things that we share here are mysterious and are hidden. And the reason God hides them is because he, because he wants you to be hungry. He wants you to seek them out. You seek out the things that you desire that you value, that are treasure. So I want to encourage you to come hungry every night. I want to encourage you to be treasure hunters on these nights. Come like the man who found that treasure in the field and he sold everything to get that land because he knew the worth of that treasure. That's what the ways of God is like. That is the kingdom of God, the knowledge of God. It is eternal riches. So I encourage you to be treasure hunters. Amen? So we're going to look into the wisdom and the ways of God, part two, the brilliant life of Moses. So let's look at some wisdom scriptures. Good to get into Proverbs. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Dwell on that for a while. Sila. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Then Proverbs 8, 13 and 17 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's a strong word. Is to Hate evil. And I love those who love me, says the Lord. And those who seek me early and diligently shall find me. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, will rest on him. This is talking of the Lord Jesus himself. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. So that there's a spirit of wisdom that you can receive tonight. You can be imparted with the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power and of might, New King James, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There it is again. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. I want to tell you the fear of the Lord is something that is beautiful, that is precious, that is even delight. To the spirit. God delights in the fear of the Lord and it says here it is the beginning of wisdom. It says here it is to hate evil. This is my question to you. This is the very beginning. If I can't take you to this place, I can't take you any further. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what is the fear of the Lord? To hate evil. This is my question to you. Do you hate Do you hate it because it keeps you from intimacy with Jesus? Because to the extent that you hate sin is to the extent that you love God. This is the beginning of wisdom. If there is anything that you can take away is to ask God for the fear of the Lord. And I'm not talking about what some say the fear of the Lord is. They say, oh, it's just the awe of God. Oh, he's awesome. He's awesome in this place. No, I'm talking about the fear of God that I read in this book. Isaiah 6, woe is me, encounter. I am undone. 
fear of the Lord. I'm talking about Revelation, the Apostle John falling down though is dead before the presence of God, before the angels that cry, holy, holy, holy. I'm talking about encounters where I've seen intercessors hiding under chairs because they've encountered the fear of the Lord. You can have this kind of encounter. This is God. And I want to even go so far as to say this. And if you disagree with me, come see me in the break. I'll lovingly show you scripture. But I can say this. If you do not know the fear of the Lord, if you do not have the fear of the Lord, or want it, or seek it, you cannot know God. Come on. And I'll go even further. If you are a minister who does not preach the fear of the Lord, who does not live the fear of the Lord, you are not presenting person of Jesus, the person that I read of in here, what are you doing? You are presenting a different Jesus, like it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, a different Jesus. And you might preach about grace and mercy and love and the Father's heart, and those are all aspects, wonderful aspects of who God is. But if you do not talk about the fear of the Lord, which is just as much who he is. You are creating an idol for people. Another Jesus. It is as serious as walking into church, chiseling out a physical idol, putting it on stage and saying, worship that. Seek that. So what we do on these nights is not just good information. This is vital to you fulfilling the promises and to you knowing God and to you becoming someone who represents fully the person of Jesus because if you're not committed to that, be careful, friend. You can create an idol for people and there is a consequence. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning, it's the entry, it's the gateway to wisdom, to knowing Him. So I exhort you, pray for the fear of the Lord. And I can tell you that when you receive the fear of the Lord, it is the most freeing, joyous, wonderful thing. Because it keeps you on the path of his blessing. It keeps you in the path of intimacy with him beyond anything you could think or imagine. And that's why he brings it. It's because he loves you so much. He wants you to know him. So that's the beginning. The fear of the Lord. Hating sin. And that's not saying condemnation. If you fall down in sin. It's me, it means, God, I hate that sin. I repent of it. Cast me not away from your presence, but do a deep work in me, God. Godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That's hating evil. Getting rid of everything in your life that causes temptation. If it's lust, getting rid of it. You might have to switch the TV off. You might have to not go to the beach where there's bikini-clad people. <laughs> you know, you, That's hating evil. If you come to that place, man, chosen, you are positioning yourself for greatness. The knowledge of the ways of God. James 1, 5 and 6. God promises to give wisdom generously to anyone who asks or seeks him for it. He wants you to come after him. He wants you to seek out his ways. Wisdom greases the wheels of life. And here's the thing. Wisdom goes hand in hand with peace. This is really, really important. And you'll find the word peace throughout Proverbs, throughout wherever it talks about God's wisdom. Wisdom and ways concept here says, if your life or relationships lack 
peace. If they're in constant turmoil and conflict, or if you find yourself frustrated all the time, it's probably time to take a moment to wait on God and to ask for his wisdom. If there's constant friction, and we're going to talk and go more deeply into relationship wisdom, I'm looking forward to going into wisdom and courting and wisdom in marriage relationships and parenting. I'm sorry we can't go really in depth into them, but hopefully next week I'm looking to go into boundary setting and wisdom boundaries, love boundaries, and it all plays out in finances and relationships and marriage and parenting. But that's a wisdom a principle that God gives us in Scripture. But if there's no peace in your relationship, for instance... Can I give you an, an example from my life of God teaching me? You know, it says in the Word that you can hear his voice. And a lot of the time I hear him whispering in a voice of wisdom behind me. And it says in Isaiah here, Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go. This is the way, walk in it, whether to the right or to the left. So you know that God is the greatest marriage counselor of all. <laughs> or relationship counselor. Spirit of wisdom and counsel. And I remember one time we were going through um, a little period in our marriage, Chris and I, and it was mostly from me. <laughs> and I was going through this phase where I was, you know, I just need more from you, you know, like I just need this and I need that and I, and I need more encouragement and, and why don't you do this and why don't you do that and, you know, there was, there was lack of peace, tell you what. <laughs> it was like, you know, you're, not, you're not, not doing everything I expected. You know, one of the things that we find in, in marriage counselling is, is that people put expectations on their spouse they shouldn't. You know, like for instance, a wife might expect to go on, on a date night every week. <laughs> Or be brought flowers, you know, all the time. And, and the husband doesn't know that's her expectation. And maybe it's an un unrealistic expectation. But I had this expectation of Chris, like, you need to be this to me, you need to be that, and you need to do this, and you need to encourage me more. And, and it was causing fights and friction. And then all of a sudden I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Cheryl, Chris is not meant to fulfill every emotional need of your heart. I am. Only I can fulfill and satisfy every need of your heart. And at that moment, it was like, boom. Wow. You know, your spouse isn't meant to fulfill every need. And we're not perfect, right? Only God is perfect. And so God was saying, look to me for encouragement when you need encouragement. Look to me for emotional support when you need that. Look to my word for courage. Look to me as your source. And that just brought breakthrough. <laughs> I want to encourage you to listen in those points of friction and lack of peace in your day, even in your workplace, and ask the Lord for wisdom. And he said it so gently, <laughs> so lovingly, so beautifully. <laughs> and it was like a bomb went off. <laughs> Gentle word breaks the bone, right? Revelation. He will guide you on the path. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him right behind your voice will say, this is the way you should go. You know, Genesis 5.24, one of my favorite, favorite verses. Enoch, what? Walked with. Everyone say with. With God. Not behind. Not in front. But with God. Ever seen somebody walk behind God? It's like, he's going this way and they're dragging the chain. Oh, I'm just not good enough. I just can't do it. I'm just like, I don't have the skills and I don't have and this fear and this discouragement. God's walking. He 
says, hey, walk with me. Hear my voice. I have chosen you. You are my beloved. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just walk. Or else have you seen someone racing ahead and trying to make it happen? Going ahead of God's ways and timing, you know. Get myself out there on YouTube. Bring up churches and ask them if I can preach. You know, running ahead of God and God's walking at this godly pace. He said, hey, walk with me. Enoch got it. You know what happened to Enoch? He was not. <laughs> I love that. He got so good at walking in the ways of God, with God, that God said, that's it, I've got to take you. You've got to be with me. He walked straight into the supernatural. Eternity. Eternal ways. You want to walk in the supernatural? I know a lot of prophetic people tell me, I want to walk in the supernatural, walk in the ways of God. Walk with Him. And so if you find yourself like in turmoil and things aren't happening for you and stuff's not working out, and it's time to stop. Be still. Shut this. Ask him for wisdom. He is faithful. Wisdom and ways concept. If you do things God's way, not in our own way, walking with him in intimacy, obeying his voice always, he will in the end bring about blessing exceedingly abundantly beyond what you could ever think or imagine, far beyond your own natural abilities could achieve. Ephesians 3.20, that was the reading for today if you're following the verse of the day app. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you could think or imagine, what you could make or try to make happen. Case in point, Job, double blessing, Abraham, father nations, yet barren at old age, David, Moses, Joseph, the Lord Jesus. The, the Lord told me tonight there are Josephs here. This is the term for you. This is the process of the ways of God that Joseph had to go through. And you're a dreamer. I saw that you're, you dream a lot. And you have a Joseph quality. And in that decades of process, he had to learn the ways of and we get asked, you know, how come we haven't heard this stuff before? I, I can tell you that the teaching that Chris and I are just now releasing comes from 15, 20 years of the dealings of God. <laughs> and he's still dealing. <laughs> the dealings of God. And I can't stand here and teach this except that I can say I've had to live this. This is my life on a page. <laughs> and so did Joseph. So did all the greats. Will you give yourself to the dealings of God? Because the anointing oil comes from the pressing of the olive. There must be a pressing. You know, we have a lot of people who at, uh, approach us and want to minister at our church. And we're not a huge, successful, brand-name church. It's amazing how many people approach us and say, we want to preach. Can we preach at your church? Can we do this? Can we do that? And the first thing I look for is, is there the marks of the cross? Paul said, I bear on my body the marks. Is there the evidence of the dealings of God in this person's life? There will be a humility. There will be not a pushiness. 
I often ask them about their family. How's your wife or your husband? How are your children? I like to meet their family. We usually like to have coffee with them and get to know them, get to know their heart, know those who labor amongst you, it says in Thessalonians. Are their kids going well? Because wisdom is proved right by her. Is your wife going well? Proverbs says that the wife is the crown of the husband. What's a crown? A crown is a sign of authority. So when I look at your wife, she is a sign of how you handle authority. Do you care for her? Is she fulfilling the call of God on her life? Is she prospering in God? Is she full on for Jesus? Is she a wonderful example of a godly woman? Because that shows me your ministry. And then I also ask them, and I tend to prefer that they're either pastoring on a regular basis a flock or have in the past, over a period of time, pastored, laid down their life on a day-to-day -day basis for someone else. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for. You know, it's easy to be, and I believe that at some point we will become itinerant ministers in different phases of our life, but it's easy to blow in and blow out, isn't it? It's easy to blow into a fellowship or a ministry, drop a word, and then never have to deal with people ever again. <laughs> but it takes a mother or a father, a true prophet or apostle, or evangelist, or teacher, or pastor, to day in, day out, week in, week out, lay down your life for someone else, right? That's where parenting comes in. God trained me through parenting. You know, a lot of the time I don't feel like going to pick up my kids from school. I'm tired. But if I don't, they won't fulfill the call of God on their life. Their destiny. So I pick myself up, and I'm like Jesus who had he said, foxes of holes, birds of nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. I want to tell you that if you want to go anywhere in God, you're going to have to sometimes do things tired. And, amen? <laughs> Pastor, I don't want to come to school tonight. I'm tired. Well, that's your decision. But I can tell you that if you want the things of God, if you want to know Him, if you want to be chosen of him, you're going to have to press past something. That's a bit of tough love, isn't it? But join me. I won't, don't say anything unless I'm living it. <laughs> join me in going after Jesus. There's going to be times where you're going to have to lay some things down. Pastor, I'm too tired to go to prayer. I believe that God will give you supernatural strength. You need to pray. My house should be called a house of prayer. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up and make your lives significant. You know, Moses, I talk about this, about visitations. Uh, one day he, he appeared to me and told me this. He said, the reason I was able to be described as the meekest man on the face of the earth was because I submitted to the ways of God. And you will see this in Moses' life. They were the dealings of God. You know, everyone wants to play the movie and fast forward to the parting of the Red Sea and signs, wonders, and miracles and you know, all the wonders of heaven and gnats and hailstorms and you know, blood Red Sea and all the miraculous stuff. But I tell you, this term, we're going to focus on that part of the process which led to 
him being entrusted with that. And they are the dealings of God. God dealt with Moses to the point where he became so meek. He humbled himself, submitted to the ways and the dealings of God. I can tell you that when you fight against God, it's a losing battle. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Time to stop fighting God. And learning about the ways of God will help you understand that He does not change. But He is bringing something to deal with the heart. And it will bring a meekness to you. It will bring you to a place of absolute dependency on Him, which is humility. He will strip away every false ambition, every other motive of the heart that is not love. He will bring you to the cross. And it's his love. These are the ways of God. God's dealings in his life caused him to surrender all fleshly means and submit to God. Wisdom and ways concept. Meekness comes from submitting to the ways of God. Here's one thing I know. Try to fight against God. You will lose. But submit to him and you position yourself for greatness. Humility is total dependency on him. You can't make that prophecy or calling come to pass. It must be all God. And you know the neat thing about that, the awesome thing about that, Isn't he smart? <laughs> Isn't he all wise? So here we are, wisdom and ways concept. The greater the call, the greater the dealings of God. The higher the level of calling, the more will be asked of you. Luke 12, 28 says, To him who is given much, much will be required. And you can read Hebrews eleven twenty four to 27 all about Moses. Learning this first of God's ways, and I'm hoping to cover this in the next five minutes. <laughs> God's ways number one. To go up, you must give up. To go up, you must give up. It will cost you everything. God will deal with your heart. And it says here in the Amplified, in the bold, he considered, saying of Moses, the contempt and abuse and shame born for the Christ, the Messiah who was to come, to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, which speaks of the world. For he looked forward in a way to the reward, recompense, Motivated by faith, he left Egypt behind him, being unawed and undismayed by the wrath of the king. For he never flinched, but held staunchly to his purpose and endured steadfastly as one who gazed on him who is invisible. Isn't that awesome? God will bring you to a place where all you have is him. And it is a blessing. He will often ask you to lay something of great worth down or withhold something from you for a season to train your heart so that you can be entrusted with greatness. It's his love. You know, God's ways are low and slow. Tenderizing your heart over time, not microwave or drive through you know, today, by chance, but I know it wasn't by chance, it was by God, I bought a slow cooker. <laughs> I was going to buy a rice cooker, but I walked into JV Hi-Fi and they said, oh, you know, these are the ranges of rice cookers. By the way, this one's also a slow cooker. And I thought, oh, bonus. I get, you know, two and one, two for the price of one. I'm walking out with this uh, slow cooker rice cooker. And uh, I 
this is the thing. Like, I always ask, if you want to know my ways, we're talking about the ways of people and ways of God. Chris knows this. I always ask about warranty. <laughs> That's the annoying thing about me. I go, is there a warranty? <laughs> And she said, yeah, yeah, there's one year. Oh, right. And so can we extend that warranty? She said, yeah, you can pay extra and then get a longer warranty, which causes it to go further. I want to tell you that Jesus paid the price with his own blood. A great price so that you could go further. So you could know his way. And you know when you eat a meal that's been slow cooked, it's winter time, right? We love our slow cooked meals. You compare that with the microwave dinner you put in that machine and put in for a minute, it comes out and it's full of, it's dehydrated, it's full of preservatives and it's like, Bleh. That's what junk food is like. You know, we just read about humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you in due time. That's the slow-cooked meal. <laughs> it's so good. It's tenderizing your heart. <laughs> it's intense in flavor. It comes from low and slow. Get down low. Get humble. Over time, you're going to have to go through some winter seasons. It's who you are in the winter seasons. That's the real you. Low and slow. And I promise you, if you give yourself to the ways of God, the process tastes like Jesus. Spirit will come. encourage you to be a student of the ways of God, the process. You have to give up to go up. You know, Abraham, all the greats had to do the same. Job had things stripped away from him. David was taken away from the pinnacle and lived in a cave for a while. <laughs> Abraham, what was he asked to do? The very child of promise, Isaac, God says to him, sacrifice him, put him on the altar. And he says, God, this is the promise. Who's got a promise from God? He's got a prophecy on the altar. And it's said amazingly that he had so much faith in God that he believed that even if he killed his own son, God could raise him from the dead. How amazing faith is that? But get this. Do you know that mountain that God had him climb to sacrifice his son? Mount Moriah. Moriah means visible to God. It also means seen by God. Or another meaning of Moriah means chosen or ordained. I want to tell you that if you want to be chosen, the word of God says, many are called, few are chosen. Why are few chosen? I believe they're not willing to pay the price. They're not willing to lay it all down. See, Abraham got to the point where he said, I love you so much, God, I will obey you and I will lay it all down. Even the child of promise, <laughs> that prophecy, that destiny, that seed. And the altar speaks of the heart. And God said, my son, you have passed the test. You are chosen. I see you. That's what God's looking for. One in a million. All the greats had to go through it. The Lord Jesus himself stepped down from heaven, gave it all up, became the lowest of the low, servant, died the lowest of all deaths, and then was given the name above all names, 
the ways of God. So what's the secret? Instant obedience, no matter what the cost. Financially, emotionally, lifestyle changes. Who knows that sometimes, a lot of the time, when God asks you to do something, it's not financially viable. (laughs) It doesn't make sense financially. But it's God. He will ask you to give something up. And we've seen it over and over in our lives. You know, some of you have heard some of my story. But when I got saved, I got so saved at revival. And I told God I would give him everything. And he held me to that promise. <laughs> and so at the time, I was in a really well-paid career, climbing the corporate ladder. Chris and I had just got married. I was earning more than him at the time. On my way up to corporate success, and God says, in three months of our marriage, I want you to have a baby. And then on top of that, he says, bombshell, I want you to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm going, that can't be me. That has to be the Spirit of God because that would not be a voice in my heart of my own making. (laughs) What? was completely foreign to me. It was like, but I'm earning more money. It makes sense for me to keep working and just, you know, I've got it all planned out, my maternity leave and then <laughs> half pay for 12 months and then I can go back and continue my career. And instant obedience. And I can tell you this, every time that I have obeyed the voice of God wholeheartedly, there has been blessing at the end. So God asked me to lay something down. And Chris's life story is powerful. And you've heard some of it. But God asked him to lay his line down. Often it will be in the area where he has called you. Or it will be something that is so precious to you or that you could possibly hold on to for your security. And he strips it away and he says, I am your God. I am your provider. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There were years we were renting. We didn't know whether we could afford rent that week. I didn't know whether I could buy that loaf of bread that week. (laughs) But God said, and through all of that obedience, God brought about, and we'll talk about this more in financial wisdom, we were able to buy a house miraculously. We had favor, doors open, exceedingly beyond what you could ever make happen. Today, I don't work in a secular job, but all my needs and more are provided for. And it is God. He does exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we could think or imagine. So to go up, you've got to So, Father, I thank you for your wonderful, wonderful ways. (laughs) I thank you for the school of the Holy Spirit that you took me on as a stay-at-home mom. And you taught me about the ways of God and you're still teaching today. So I thank you, Father, for wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. The spirit of wisdom and counsel to preside in each heart in this place. And I pray for layers of revelation of who you are to flood into our hearts even beyond tonight, beyond this time and place, that you would reveal the person, wisdom, Jesus. And we bless you and worship you with all our hearts and seek you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.